One summer night, I was on a train that was speeding eastward across southern New Mexico. It was one of the white nights of that region when the full moon, shining like sun-lighted snow and hanging so low in the sky that it seems to be dropping earthward, fills the clear, dry air with a silvery radiance and floods the barren plain with a transfiguring whiteness in which the gray sands glimmer as if with some unearthly light of their own. The day had been long, wearisome, and unspeakably hot and dusty, and with the coming of this beautiful night and its cool breezes, most of the passengers betook themselves to the car steps and platforms where they lingered until we reached the little town of Sipo late in the evening. As the train stopped, we saw that apparently the entire population of the village was crowded inside the station house. One after another, men came cautiously out upon the platform, carrying guns in their hands and casting long, anxious looks across the plain. Their set faces and ready revolvers and rifles showed that it was no ordinary matter which had sent the whole town to find protection in the railroad depot. They told us that a man had come running into town a little while before, and, falling headlong, exhausted at the feet of the first person he met, had cried out that the Apaches were coming. Hastily revived and cared for, he explained that the Indians had attacked a cattle camp ten or twelve miles south of Sipor, where he and some other cowboys had been making a roundup and killed all but himself. He had managed to creep out undiscovered and had run at the top of his speed all the way to Sipar to bring the warning. He said that the Apaches, in a large band numbering at least a hundred, had surprised the camp, killing the men as they lay in their blankets and committing horrible atrocities upon the dead bodies, and had then fallen upon the horses and cattle, killing and maiming the poor beasts in mere lust of cruelty. He was sure they were following him. He had heard their yells several times during his desperate race, and each time he had redoubled his speed. His shoes were gone, his stocking hung in shreds from his ankles, and his feet were a mass of raw and bleeding flesh, pierced by hundreds of cactus thorns. He had hurried away on an eastern-bound freight train to Demi, the next station, to rouse the citizens and help to raise a malicious company, whose coming was expected in a few hours and telegrams had been sent to Fort Bayard giving news of the outbreak and asking for a troop of cavalry. Every soul in Sipar, men, women, and children, with all the arms and ammunition in the town, had hauled up in the station house that they'd be able to make a successful resistance, and as one man said, make as many good engines as the Lord would let them. For in those days, the hearts of the bravest in the southwest knew terror, and with good reason when the Apache went on the warpath. The train sped on into the radiant white night, but the car steps and platforms were deserted. The passengers also at their berths as soon as possible, there to lie below the level of the windows and pile all the pillows they can get between themselves and the side of the car. When we reached Deming, we found the place in an uproar. Every bell in town, from the gong of the railroad restaurant to the church bell, was ringing its loudest and wildest. Men in varying degrees of undress were running up and down the streets, calling loudly upon all citizens to come out at once. The people were assembling at the depot, where two or three of the cooler-headed had taken the place of leaders and had begun to organize the excited mass into an armed and officered company and get it ready to go quickly to the assistance of beleaguered little Sipo. Then our train sped on again through the wondrous night, and I knew no more about the Indian War at Sipar until I sat on the kitchen doorstep at Apache Tale, one evening some years later, and beguiled Texas Bill into telling me yarns of his long and checkered experience as a cowboy. The cool, soft breath of evening filled the air, the alfalfa field glowed in its most vivid emerald in the yellow rays of the setting sun, and in the same rich light the gray barren hillside beyond shone like beaten gold. And Texas Bill, just in from a week's trip on the range, soothed and inspired by the civilizing influences of the ranch house, a shave, clean clothes, and a supper, unbent from his usual bashful dignity and talked. Texas Bill was tall and big and loose-jointed, and he spoke always in a long, soft, and different drawl. 
He held two articles of belief which no man might dispute without getting sight of the knife in his bootleg or the revolver on his hip. One was that Texas was the biggest and best state in the Union, and the other that the cow business was no longer fit for a gentleman to follow. He lounged on a bench beside the door and told me tales of the range in the roundup, of herds of cattle stampeded by the smell of water, of long rides and blinding sandstorms, of the taking in of the tenderfoot, of centipedes and sidewinders, of Indian fights and narrow escapes. Were you ever in one of these Indian attacks yourself, I asked, for his Indian yarns had been about other men. Texas Bill solemnly considered the heel of his boot a moment, and then just as solemnly replied, Yes, I was killed by the Apaches once. He turned a serious face off towards Cook Peak, which towered a mighty sculptured mass of purest sapphire blue against a turquoise sky, and I, seeing that his countenance bore just such an expression of inscrutable solemnity as it might have done had he been acting as chief mourner of his own funeral, answered just as soberly, That must have been very interesting. I wish you'd tell me about it. His gaze returned to his feet, his face relaxed into a smile. A chuckle began somewhere in his throat, wandered down his long frame, and lost itself in his boots, which were high-heeled and two sizes too small for him. Then he spoke again. That was the time we run a blaze on parred huff. Then he relapsed into silence, contemplation of his boots and several successive and long-drawn chuckles. But at last he began a story. You see, Pard Huff, he was a tenderfoot, and there wasn't nothing he wasn't afraid of at all. You couldn't convince him that coyotes ain't dangerous, and he thought it was sure death if a tarantula looked at him. And you could make him jump out of his boots any time by just buzzing your tongue behind his ear. I reckon he'd have sure died of fright if he had ever seen a live rattlesnake spitting its tongue at him. And engines? Well, he watched for Apaches all day long, durn sight more. He did for cattle, and he couldn't sleep nights nice for being afraid they'd catch him. He didn't seem to think of anything but Apaches, and he hadn't been us very long when the boys didn't give him a chance to think of anything else at all. We was making a roundup down below Separ then, and there was ten of us in the chuck wagon would made camp at night. Well, one night, Pard Huff, he was as scared of the never. The boys struck his gate right off and kept him a-running. I didn't know they was going to blaze him quite so bad or I'd have done my best to stop the thing. Well, and they wouldn't either if he hadn't been the meanest sort of coward that ever laid awake nights. He asked each of us separate and then all of us in a bunch at supper if there was any danger of Apaches down there. And we all told him there was lots of it. One of the boys said he'd seen signs over towards Hatchet Mountain that very day that sure meant Apaches, and another said he'd heard that a little ranch about forty mile away had lately been cleaned out by them, and everybody killed. And we all talked about it, and agreed they might come on us at any minute, that most likely they'd attack us that very night, and that we ought to be getting ready for them. Well, sir, that part huff, he never said another word. He just sat there with his eyes getting bigger and his face whiter every minute. We kept it up, told stories about the way them devils do, everything we'd ever heard of, how they hold you and pull your tongue out, or cut off your ears, or run a stake through you and pin you to the ground, or smash your face to jelly with a rock, or burn you alive, till Pard Huff didn't know which end he was a-standin' on at all. We got our, our blankets and turned in, but just kept a-talkin' about the Apaches, till that Pard Huff he was shakin' as if he had a fit. One of the boys said he bet if the Apaches did come, Pard Huff would get his ears cut off the first rattle because they was so big the Indians couldn't see nothing else at all in the camp till they got them out of the way. And then bang, bang, bang went some six shooters. The boys yelled, Injuns, Apaches, as loud as they could. And the feller on the other side of Pard Huff, Pard was laying next to me, yelled out, Boys, I'm killed, says he. And he rolled over on his face and kicked and yelled and groaned. Then bang, bang, bang went the six shooters again. And then he ought to see that pard huff. Well, sir, he was sure buffalo. He jumped out of his blankets and let out one yell. The chuck wagon was right behind us, and he gave one jump and went clean over it. 
lit out across the country like an antelope. You all just ought to have seen that tenderfoot pull his freight. The boys come up a laughing and watched him run. They was a betting he wouldn't stop till he got to Apache Tayu. But I said it wasn't right to buffalo him that bad. So we all yelled and called him to come back, but he only run the faster. The darn fool tenderfoot thought it was the Apaches chasing him. We all thought he'd soon find out there was nothing wrong at all and come back. And so we went to bed again, but he didn't. The next day I had to come to Apache Tehu and I found Pard Huff's bloody tracks most all the way to Separ. He'd run right over stones and cactus and prairie dog holes and everything else in his way. And them fool people at Separ was all huddled up in the depot. And a company of men with Winchesters and six shooters was there from Deming. And everybody was watching the country all around with spyglasses for engines. Well, so that darn fool tenderfoot, that pard huff, had told them a fool yarn about a patchy surprise in our camp, killing everybody but him, and they were sure buffaloed. Yes, I said, I know they were. You? How did you know anything about it? Oh, I was there that night. I passed them on the train, and Separ and Deming were the worst scared tons I ever saw. Texas Bill chuckled, pleased at this verification of a story, and went on. Then you know what I'm telling you is sure true. I thought maybe you all mightn't believe it at all, for it sure don't look reasonable that folks could get so buffaloed over a darn fool tenderfoot's yarn. They looked at me with mighty big eyes when I rode into Separ. Says they, how did you get out alive? We sure thought you was dead. Well, says I, as far as I know, I'm sure alive, and I don't know as I've been at anything to get out of the doll. Why, says that part huff, Oh, says I, damn pard Huff, he's a tender friend and afraid of this shatter. He dreamed about Apaches and jumped up with a yell and lit out, for God's sakes. We tried to call him back, and he thought it was the Apaches after him. I reckon he scared you all half to death with this yarn. You're as bad as tender feet yourselves. But they'd got the notion scared out of them so bad they couldn't believe anything else, and they sure thought there must be Indians around somewheres. And so I left them and rode on for Apache Tail. Pretty soon I met a troop of cavalry from Fort Bayard on the track for Seaport. The captain rode up to me and says, Have you been near the scene of the Indian depredations? No, sir, says I. I hain't seen no Indian depredations, nor Injuns neither this summer. Humph, says he, that's queer. Yes, sir, says I. I think likely I heard there's been some trouble with them last night down below Seaport. But if there's been any injured depredations, I hain't seen him at all. And then I rode on, for I hadn't time to be bothered with no more of his questions. And too, I reckon, likely him and his soldiers needed some exercise. And they got it, too. They just kept on the trot for the Mexican line and kept it going for three months. They'd started out for Indians, and Indians they was bound to have. They just wound around through all that country south of Separ and over in old Mexico and back again up into the mountains and across the plains, and didn't even see the Apache the whole three months. And they didn't find out it was all nothing but a blaze on part Huff till they got come back, and I reckon about that time they concluded there ain't no bigger fool on earth than a tenderfoot at all, and there ain't neither. Well, I tell you, that part Huff was sure mad when we found out we had all been running the blaze on him. I don't know as I'd blame him much, for that ten-mile run of his to see far in his rock sock feet over cactus and stones wasn't much of a joke at all. But he was an all fired a fool tenderfoot then, we supposed, or we wouldn't have done it. End of a Blaze on Part Huff by Florence Finch Kelly.